Thank you uh, for inviting me for this uh, keynote. I'm really happy to be here and with this audience. Uh, I'm also glad that uh, Mark in the morning brought up as one of the breakthroughs in the last 12 months, that of producing a machine translation without any bilingual data. I'm also glad to be here because he mentioned Facebook. Uh, there are two strands of work. Uh, there is one group in Facebook and there's another group in the University of the Basque Country and we have simultaneous publications. It's only one day difference. Actually, ours was one day first, an archive. So I'm here, I'm glad to be here because usually people, uh, researchers in big companies like Facebook, they get uh, more media attention. But uh, what I'm going to tell you is uh, actually the same kind of topic that uh, they are working there. Um, so this is joint work with uh, Mikel Arteche and Gorka Lavaca, and we are in the ISHA NLP group in the University of the Basque Country in San Sebastian. So what is this all about? Well, uh, as you might know, uh, word embeddings, one of these, one, they are one of the key technologies in natural language processing. Uh, together with uh, deep learning, they have uh, produced in the last few years lots of uh, good results. Uh, and in the previous work, in the previous work, uh, researchers have been trying to put together word embeddings in one language uh, and word embeddings in another language. They have been putting them in the same space. Uh, usually based on bilingual dictionaries, so with some supervision. Uh, so once they have place, put them in the same place, uh, they obtain exciting results in dictionary induction, transfer learning, uh, training one system in English and applying that to other languages, and also the, this vision of having an interlingual semantic representation of, of language. Uh, coming from the Basque Country, uh, one of uh, the focus of our team is to extend uh, these kinds of technologies to any pair of languages. So not only there are low resource languages like Basque, uh, for which parallel data or bilingual resources between English and Basque or uh, Basque and French are not uh, so common, but also even for major languages like English, uh, or oh, sorry, major languages like uh, Spanish, uh, it's difficult to find uh, bilingual dictionaries freely available for any other language, even for Russian, there's a, there are not very big dictionaries and there's no big uh, parallel data. So even for large languages, this is a problem. So you don't have all the bilingual resources that you would want when you are working even with a major language because uh, this doesn't apply to the rest of the languages. Um, we think that this is a key research area for the wide adoption of NLP tools. Uh, once a company has a good NLP tool for whatever task in one language, they need to build it for yet another language, and that's very resource intensive. So that's uh, one of the goals here. Actually, we put this into the stream, and not only we are going to cases where we don't have uh, bilingual resources, uh, sorry, where we have uh, small bilingual resources, we are going to the, the scenario where you don't have any. So that's what we call unsupervised embedding mapping, or that's what we call unsupervised neural machine translation. Okay, what's, what's our vision? What was our vision two years ago when we started with this? So imagine that you have a large corpus of, of Arabic and you can build these word representations, these semantic uh, word representations, which are so useful for Arabic. That's a standard technology. Actually, you can do this for any other language that you have large uh, bodies of corpora, like Chinese. And our vision is that we will be able to map them together into the same space. Once you have them in the same space, you, ha you can do many things. Uh, one thing you can do is you can induce bilingual dictionaries. And actually, this is one of the techniques that we will use to evaluate the quality of these mappings. Another thing uh, that you can do is all these kinds of uh, cross-lingual and multilingual transfer learning from one language to the other. I'm not going to talk about that today. And the other thing that you can try to do is uh, machine translation without any bilingual resource. Um, I'll separate my talk in two parts. Uh, most of, my, of the talk would be about uh, bilingual embedding mappings because this is the key technology which allows to do the, the rest of the things. So I'm going to review bilingual embedding mappings and then later in the talk I'll go to the more surprising or more exciting uh, news about unsupervised neural machine translation. So first I'll do a very slow, a, a very brief introduction of uh, what are word embeddings. I guess most of the audience here would know but sometimes people from the industry or uh, other technologies are not aware, so I'll do a very brief introduction. Also, I'll introduce what, what are uh, the bilingual embedding mappings and the current state of the art, where you have supervised 
techniques, and then I'll go little by little reducing the supervision that we need to obtain these 7D mappings. So, short introduction. So, this is actually a map of the Basque Country. Here we have, in the geographical space, the seven major cities in the Basque Country. You might not recognize them because they are in Basque. Uh, but gi given that this is a map, even if you don't know very well the labels, you know that the distances are meaningful. So, in geographical space, uh, if you have two points close together, that means that the distance between them in real life, I mean, in the reality, is smaller than cities which are farther apart. There are also meaningful relations like north, east, west, which makes sense in geographical space. Uh, usually we are used to, our mind is used to work in 2D, maybe 3D, but maps are usually 2D, and th they are built by hand by cartographers, and nowadays by machines as well. Uh, I bring this up because the semantic space, the vector space is very similar. Uh, here we have words in a semantic space. Here you have some words for English. Uh, in this semantic space, in this word embedding space, this vector uh, space, the distances are also meaningful. So words which have similar meaning, like dog and cat, will be closer in this space than words which are uh, not so similar, like pair and house. Some relations are also meaningful. So if we find a vector which goes from dog to the noise that a dog does, that a dog does in English, like bark, we can use this same, uh, this same vector to go from cat to meow and from cow to moo. So this is a well-organized semantic space. Uh, usually this is very high dimensional. Uh, most of embeddings work around some hundreds dimensions, 300 is a usual number. And this is built using a, neural networks, also linear algebra, and they are based on co-occurrence information. That is, all these maps are built just counting how many times two words occur together in a sentence or in a window, right? That's all you need to induce these spaces. They are extremely popular because you don't need many resources, just text. Okay, what is uh, embedding mapping? Imagine that uh, some early cartographers uh, speaking Basque draw this map of the Basque Country. They were not interested in north, so they just shifted it this way. Uh, some Spanish-speaking cartographers did a similar map. They were not interested in north either. Um, the idea is that uh, we are going to find a transformation which, given uh, some cities that you know where are in each of the spaces, we are going to find a transformation which uh, transforms one of the spaces, say the Basque space, and puts it together in the same space as the Spanish space, right? So you find in this case like a small rotation and then they fit together, right? You can do this because uh, you have information about the three cities which are uh, spelled differently in Spanish, which are spoken differently in Spanish and, and Basque. Bilbao is Bilbo, Bayona is Bayona, and Pamplona is Iruña. So you find this rotation, this transformation, which fits together these three cities that you know are the same. Once you do this, the nice thing is that actually you can mine the rest of the cities. So now that you find the correspondence between the three cities, now you can find the correspondences between the rest of the cities. Right? So actually, this is what a word embedding mapping is. So if we go to word space, now I draw uh, in the right for Basque and in the left for English. Uh, the process is similar. We, if we have a seed dictionary, a small dictionary of a few words, like dog is chakur in Basque, apple sagar, etc., we need to find a transformation which makes the embeddings of those three words, right, rotate, so the Basque space is rotated or is transformed to overlap nicely with the, with the English space. So the embeddings for those, sorry, so the embeddings for those three words fit, fit nicely, right? Well, more formally, uh, each of these words has a corresponding word embedding, which is a three-dimensional vector, right? So we can represent uh, the meaning of chakur with a three-dimensional vector. For Sagar, the same. That's the X space. That's the source space. And we can do the same for the target space. So instead, we have in the rows the vectors for the corresponding words. So the task is to find this transformation, which is actually going to be a matrix, a square matrix, which we multiply by, uh, which multiplies the source space 
and you roughly the goal is to uh, is that the resulting space should be the same as the English space. So this was formulated by Mikolov very early, like five years ago. Very early, I mean, very uh, very close after he released the the word embeddings, and the, uh, he calculated it with SGD, minimizing the distance of the transform uh, source space, so x times w, minimizing the distance of the xw with the set space. That is, putting as many words as possible in correspondence to each other. Uh, once you have this matrix, now you can use this to induce a dictionary. So we have this, uh, this word in Basque, eche, and if you want to know the translation in English, you just have to find, to map it to the other space, and then you, you need to find the nearest neighbor in English, which uh, corresponds to this word. And this way, you can produce a larger bilingual dictionary for a pair which was not in the original dictionary. Right? OK, I'm going, going to run quickly through this, because there's not much time for technical details. Uh, the, we call this supervised mapping. Why? Because usually, the techniques that have been tested in laboratory conditions, they have been using dictionaries of 5,000 pairs, which is a large enough number to call it a training dictionary. Right? Uh, the current state of the art, when we published this in, in January in AAAI, uh, was a framework which kind of subsumed uh, previous work. Uh, uh, we set up a framework where there are some optional steps, and those steps, depending on when you are using these uh, optional steps or not, you will be using one method or another. Uh, there is one preprocess where you normalize the length, you do mean centering, then you do optionally some whitening of the space. These are familiar things for people working with geometry. And the key step, the one where you do the mapping, in our case, is orthogonal. So being an orthogonal mapping, you need to, to find a matrix which is orthogonal, so there is an analytic solution, no need of SGD. We don't need to, to use uh, stochastic gradient extent. We can solve it analytically with SBD. It's called a Procastres problem and has been well known for, for decades. Then optionally, we could do some reweightening and some deweightening to recover the original space. And in this paper, we show that a proper combination of all these steps, which I don't have time here, uh, bring up to five points improvement compared to just doing the main step, which is the orthogonal uh, mapping. OK, we'll see some results later. Uh, but first, an intuition. Why, why, why is this working? Uh, we have two languages. We learn word embeddings independently using corpora, which are not related. I mean, all texts are related in our civilization, but they are not translations of each other. They are not even comparable corpora. You just learn them independently. How is it possible that we can put them together? Right? How is it possible that we apply just, uh, so if we put them together, there's no correspondence. But we can find, uh, actually, a linear transformation which puts them in the same place. How is this possible? So we think that this shows that languages have uh, this property, that the word embedding space are largely isometric. That is, if you build a word embedding space for your language of choice, it's going to be isometric. It's going to have the same distances and the same kind of relations as the word embeddings that you produce for another language. This is the intuition, and this is why this works. OK, let's move forward. So once uh, we are able to do this with supervised, the idea is, as I mentioned, to reduce supervision. So let's see if uh, we can do this little by little. So uh, in order to reduce supervision, the idea is that we need to find this mapping, which puts everything in the same space nicely. And previous work used some bilingual signal for training. I just want to briefly mention that there are techniques using parallel corpora, also comparable corpora, but the best results to date uh, are based on the relatively big dictionaries. And what we are going to do now is we are going to reduce the dictionary to just 25 pairs. And I'm going to show that this works with the same quality. Uh, you, one could also use numerals, because numerals, digits, they are in most of the alphabets. So there is also a one-to-one -one correspondence usually between 1984 or 2018 and 2018 in all the languages. So you can use also this as a trick to bootstrap an initial dictionary. And then finally, I'll show you that we can do this with nothing. Because there are some alphabets which 
don't, don't have any string in common. OK, the key is something, a technique we call self-learning, which is an iterative process. So starting with monolingual embeddings, we take uh, the seed dictionary, this is a small dictionary, say 25 uh, word pairs, and we just apply our mapping technique of choice. Uh, then once we map the two spaces, just using nearest neighbors, we can induce a new dictionary. Actually, now we can induce a dictionary for the whole vocabulary, right? We can assume that this dictionary is in a way better than the previous dictionary. So now that we have a better dictionary, why not iterate? So we can do a new mapping and obtain a new dictionary. Note that this new dictionary doesn't need to be the same. It doesn't even need to keep the 25 original pairs. Because every time you do a, a small rotation and you find the nearest neighbor, it might be that you are retur returning different words. So the dictionary keeps evolving. It's not that some pairs are fixed and the rest are moving, it's that everything is computed afresh. So this is the idea, we just iterate and that's it. So it's like too good to be true, it's too simple, right? It's just iterative, uh, all, the, all the tricks are in the supervised mapping step, that's, you know, that's uh, a technique that uh, has lots of details, but once you have that, you just iterate. OK, we did uh, some experiments. Uh, so given uh, two pairs of monolingual embeddings in two languages, plus a seed dictionary of, say, 25 pairs. This is what I'm going to show. Uh, by the way, this was published uh, one year ago at ACL. Uh, and then we induced the bilingual dictionary after doing some iterations of the self-learning loop. Uh, for evaluation, we just compare this induced dictionary with some gold standard dictionary that we have and you just see the overlap and we measure accuracy. Okay? So if a pair in our induced dictionary is the same as a pair in the gold standard dictionary, we have an accurate system. Okay, here you have lots of information, by the way. So uh, in the bottom, we have the C dictionary side. So 5,000, sorry, it's like 500, but this is 5,000 in the rightmost corner. This is the supervised column, right? So here we see the results of uh, the state-of-the-art methods at the time including Mikolov, and we see that they more or less stay top. This is like the highest accuracy at the time, around 40, for English-Italian, right? So this is the goal. This is what we can obtain with uh, 5,000 pairs, OK? In the left side, we have the same techniques when you have a very small dictionaries of 25. They fail. The dictionaries they produce are of very low quality. Actually, uh, when you increase the, the seed size with 1,000, you already start to obtain results around 30, with 3,000 you are already close here, and with 5,000 they are more or less in the same ballpark, right? So what happens with the self-learning algorithm? So the self-learning algorithm, actually in the first iteration, is one of these uh, algorithms. Actually we use ours, et al. 2016, we use that. In the first iteration it's down here, right? But as it goes with iterations, not needing any other any other seed dictionary, it obtains already the red bullet here. So with only 25, these are 25, 50, oh sorry, this is 5, 10, 25, 50, 100, oh sorry, five, oh, so I'm getting confused. So 1,000, 500, uh, 250, 100, 25 is the one here. So you are getting more or less the same results as using the 5,000, right? So the self-learning algorithm is really effective. You are getting the same results with 25 as you are getting with 5,000. Again, this is even more surprising than the previous supervised uh, mapping approaches, right? Why does this work? So we think that there is an implicit objective, which I'll, sh I'll try to show you uh, in, uh, graphically. Uh, the key idea is that for each word in Basque, also for each word in English, sorry, you are able to find the matching word in Italian, right? Uh, as close as possible. So you just need to measure the distance between each word in your source language and the closest word in the target language. This is what's in the objective function. And this is the intuition, oh, sorry, with Basque and English again. So we don't use labels. We just need to find a kind of transformation, a linear transformation. 
which puts all the points as close as possible to each other. So the only thing we need to do is for each green point, the bus point, measure the distance to the closest red point. In the beginning, it's going to be large. With the first dictionary, hopefully, we'll find a solution which is, has red points a bit closer. We iterate. We continue iterating until at some point, each green point in Basque has a red point close by. Okay? And for doing this, you don't actually need any seed dictionary. Right? So this, this measure is independent from the seed dictionary. So we think that implicitly, not explicitly, but our self-learning algorithm is uh, optimizing this implicit objective. Uh, why do we need a seed dictionary? Okay, I'll show you some empirical results with both show uh, this, the, the answer to these two issues. One is that uh, we are able to, so the optimization of the objective function correlates with accuracy. And the other one is that we need to do one trick for the seed dictionary. Uh, so here, here we have the implicit objective. Oops, sorry. This is the implicit objective. And this here, we are plotting the implicit objective for each iteration of the self-learning algorithm for different sizes of the dictionary. For instance, when we have the full supervised dictionary on top, the, the, the red one, uh, it converges very fast. So with a few iterations, we are getting the maximum accuracy. Okay? When we are using the 25, this is the, the, this one in purple, it goes slower. So it converges later, but it continues here, and at some point it will converge more or less, but it goes slower. This is the objective function. We just measure the objective function. We are not explicitly optimizing. We are just measuring it, right? And here we have the, the random start. So instead of using 25, we just initialize the W at random and run the self-learning algorithm. You see that it also, the objective function also grows. So what happens with accuracy? So if our hypothesis is true, so if we are implicitly optimizing this objective function, then the accuracy should grow as the objective function grows. And actually we see that the accuracy, for instance, for the 5,000 red one, that starts up here, and the accuracy grows for all of them. Even for the 25, the purple one, it takes some, some time, so the objective function goes fast very quickly, but the accuracy goes slowly, then fast, and then kind of, in the end, it kind of converges. So it's true, so but it seems it's, this is indication that we are actually optimizing this objective function. The other thing is, does random initialization work? The objective function was improving, but actually, when you see the quality of the dictionary that we are inducing, even in, if the objective function is growing, it's a stuck in a very poor local minima. So the in dictionaries that we induce, if we start at random, are nonsense. It doesn't work, okay? So two lessons, one, the objective function is there, but it's not enough uh, to optimize this objective function with our algorithm. You need some, something to start with. That's why we need these 25 word pairs. Okay, so that was uh, what we got one year ago, and then we thought, okay, can we continue? Can we figure out a way where we can get rid of this uh, initial seed dictionary? Uh, maybe, uh, even a noise initialization would suffice. Uh, so this is the topic of the next paper. Okay, so we run this uh, unsupervised experiments. This is going to be published. It's already in archive, but it's going to be published uh, uh, officially. It's going to be presented at ACL this summer. So here we present a, a way to initialize a first noisy dictionary. Uh, the idea is that if we compute the intralanguage similarity, so for instance, for each word in English, for instance, for dog, we compute the similarity in embedding space with the rest of the vocabulary, we'll get a huge vector, vocabulary times vocabulary, with all the similarities of all possible words. Right? The idea is if uh, the two, two languages are isometric, then the, this, the histogram of the similarities for each word, if they are the same translation, they should be more or less the same. Right? I'll show you this. Uh, with a drawing. So this is the histogram of similarities for the word two in English. This is normalized and mean centered. So uh, after mean centering the similarities at zero, that's medium similarity, we have around 50 words, right? Uh, highest similarity, we have some words and then it plateaus. So it's quite uniform and then 
we have a long tail in both sides. Okay? So our prediction is that the corresponding word in, say, in Italian should have a similar distribution. Okay. I'll show you here the similarity histograms for two words in Italian. Right? They look different. So which one do you think is the one which should correspond to two in English? Would be the green one or the purple one? The green one, right? So actually, that's the histogram for two. You can see that they are not exactly the same, but they are kind of similar, okay? So we use this idea to just initialize the self-learning uh, algorithm. So having just, sorry, we use this initial idea to uh, produce one first initial dictionary, which we know is noisy. Actually, the accuracy of this dictionary is below 1%. So we have seen dictionaries and self-learning, which uh, obtains 45%. This uh, algorithm and this idea that I showed you is below 1%. This is very low. Actually, if we try self-learning on top of this, it didn't work. It was stuck in a poor local minima. Right? What we had to do is to improve, not the self-learning algorithm, but to improve the mapping technique with uh, this kind of tricks that I show you here. And after we add this to each of the self-learning uh, cycles, we were able to bootstrap a nice dictionary. So the kind of things that we did, I think the most important ones, is that we do a stochastic dictionary induction. So with a threshold, we just drop uh, the entries that we learn in the dictionary. With some probability, we just drop them. Right? Uh, we do this in a simulated annealing way. So in the beginning, we drop a lot of them because it's very noisy. And uh, as it progresses, we keep more and more until we keep all of them. And we do also frequency-based vocabulary cutoff. There's also an issue with nearest neighbor, which was uh, uh, not solved, but uh, the Facebook team uh, had a, a nice idea, and that improves results as well. OK, so let's see if this works. We have uh, this data set by Dino, uh, which was English-Italian, and we extend it in this uh, standard data set we need to have a comparable set of embeddings. So all of the teams should use the same embeddings. Uh, the same seed dictionary. Actually, we have three sets, the full supervised, semi-supervised, and unknown. Uh, we have test dictionaries with 1,500 word pairs. And these are the results for the supervised setting. So this was the state of the art before we published our paper around 43, you can notice, for instance, that the results for Finnish are lower. This is not surprising. It's agglutinative, and it's also non-Indo-European. You can also see that the results for Spanish are lower than for Italian. This has to do uh, with the corpora that were used to produce embeddings. They are, not, uh, they are coming from a different distribution, because for English, Italian, German, and Finnish, they are common crawl, and the ones available for Spanish, for some reasons, were not coming from common crawl. And then, we produce uh, the framework that uh, I, sh I, I mentioned, the supervised one, and we got the best results to date, at least in February. This is a very fast-moving area. And also, here, I, I failed to mention many relevant work in these five years, which uh, have been working on this. OK, this is for supervised. So what happens with the semi-supervised? I showed you the learning curve, and you saw that it was growing. It was more or less comparable results. I removed the last ones because when we tested this method, we were using the technology which was available at the time. So with self-learning and only 25, we get numbers which are largely comparable to the supervised method, only two points below. That was using self-learning uh, one year ago. And finally, we have the results not using anything. There are two competing uh, systems, one which predates ours. And then there's another one from the Facebook team. And this two, uh, is a paper presented uh, in February last year, and ours is presented uh, in this summer. Um, the, sorry, oops. OK. So there is an issue with, um, with the state of the art presenting our paper, is that they had convergence problem. They had been tested not in the standard, standard data sets that the community had been using, but they have been tested in word embeddings learned from Wikipedia. As you know, Wikipedia in different languages is kind of uh, comparable corpus, because 
The topics are the same, sometimes they are even translations. So the task was easier. So when they presented the results, in all the cases, their, server, their, sorry, their algorithm was converging. So they had nice results. What happened when we tested those, those results in uh, Disperse? Uh, the thing is that in many times, uh, we ran 10, 10 runs, and sometimes it would never converge. So this, the Sang et al., for instance, uh, never converge in these uh, scenarios. This has been also noted by a, a paper which is upcoming at ACL by other, other colleagues, not from our university. Uh, the system from Facebook does converge sometimes. For instance, for Italian, it converts two times out of 10, but you, know, you need to run it several times and pick the best, the best one. You cannot run it just once. Uh, it failed to converge for the finish. And finally, our method always converged and got the best results. And actually, it got even better results than the state of the art of supervised systems uh, in February. So with the additions that we did, it, we get better results without using dictionary, three points better, than what we knew how to do this uh, in February. And this happens except for finish, where we get comparable methods. <coughs> Okay, so conclusion for this section. So surprisingly, a simple self-learning method is able to train bilingual embedding mappings. It matches the supervised state of the art right now with no supervision. This is actually one of the few problems in NLP where a unsupervised method has the same, unsupervised in the sense that it's not seen any training data, uh, gets the same results as a supervised method. It's, it's actually, uh, striking that this is possible. It also shows that the signal is very strong, that the languages, the isometry between languages is very strong. Uh, the qualities, if there's any linguist in the room, he might wonder, okay, 45%, that doesn't sound like a usable dictionary. Actually, if you inspect the dictionaries that we produce, they are of higher quality than it might seem. So the, the method, the, when we measure accuracy, if it's not in the gold standard dictionary, it's like a failure. But actually, the gold standard dictionary in this data set was produced automatically because it's very difficult to get hold of real good dictionaries. Uh, so we, we check this, the real accuracy goes over 60. And in fact, uh, for frequent words, that is words for which the word embeddings have uh, enough data to be well estimated, the accuracy can go, can go up to 80%. So for frequent words, those which are most useful, the accuracy is even higher. Uh, I want to mention that this, uh, all the results are reproducible. If you go to GitHub uh, of the piece of uh, Mikel Arteche, uh, it's been updated with the last results from ACL. So you just press a, a button and you will get all the, you will download all the data sets and you'll be able to run and replicate all the results with minor variations. So it's so striking that I think that it shows, shows something fundamental about the language. I'm not a linguist myself, so I think there's something for linguists to, to look into here. And contrary to what Mark said in the morning, like this magic feeling, there's nothing under the hood. I mean, this is just co-occurrence comes from corpora and geometrical transformations, and you can make it. And these are the papers, and this finishes the, the first part of the, of the talk. Okay. Um, I did start a bit later, right? <laughs> <laughs> Two minutes. Okay, okay. Okay, actually, um, so maybe I'll skip, uh, uh, I'll go faster in the introduction of supervised NMT. So supervised machine translation works over parallel corpora. So you are, the system is given two pairs of sentences, one translation of the other, like this is my dearest dog, este es mi perro preferido. And then it learns a system which from large amounts of training data. So machine translation is one of the most successful NLP applications because the amount of uh, learning data for some language pairs is huge. Of course, the, the situation for most of language pairs is, is very different. Uh, in the case of neural machine translation, uh, it works training an encoder, which given uh, the source sentence, like the English sentence, it goes through a recurrent neural net, LSTM, and it encodes with a sequence of hidden states, it encodes the meaning, the meaning, it encodes the input. Then 
uh, taking as a base the hidden states and, and tension model, it learns to produce one by one. It learns one classifier which is able to produce the next word. All this is trained end to end, and given the large amount of training data, is as I said, is very successful. Uh, here you have uh, a diagram of uh, Google NMT at the time, uh, where they have a stack of eight LSTMs to encode and a stack of eight LSTMs to decode an attention model. Uh, in our case, we used uh, more, uh, say, we don't have so many resources, so we could only stack two LSTMs with less parameters. Um, but this is the diagram, it's the same one, but uh, simplified because I'm going to use it uh, to introduce the architecture of the unsupervised NMT system. Um, okay, so what can we do? So we change the architecture. So we cannot use uh, this architecture because we don't have parallel corpora. So what do we do? So we are going to handle both directions together. Usually the optimal setting for NMT is when you train one for English to Italian and another one from Italian to English. Um, that's one thing. So the same architecture for both language directions. We are going to share the encoder. Why? This is because as we have the word embeddings in the same space, we are going to use the same encoder because the embeddings come from the same space, right? Same encoder. So French sentence, we encode it into the same space as the English sentence. And then we'll have two decoders, one for each language. Contrary to neural machine translation, we have fixed embeddings. We, we don't compute the embeddings on the go, but these are the pre-trained embeddings, which are publicly available from all the big companies, which have been mapped to the same, same space. Okay, this is the architecture, shared encoder, decoder, and the two decoders. Uh, how do we train this? So usually we train uh, in the supervised way, we put a French sentence in the input, the English corresponding English sentence in the output, uh, we do, the, we do a forward pass, we check that it's correct, and then we backpropagate, okay? This is something that we cannot do because we don't have this. So we do something which is called autoencoding. We put a French sentence in the input and a French sentence in the output. Ideally, we could train you know, the encoder and the decoder. The problem is that this encoder-decoder only learns to copy because in the input you have the same, so this is going to learn copying. So it's not very useful. The, one of the tricks to make this work is that we are using a, what is called a denoising autoencoder, which is a fancy name for saying that we can scramble the sentence, so we swap words, the words in red, we swap them, and then the encoder-decoder architecture needs to recover the original French sentence. We do this for French, and then we do this for English. So it's the same sentence, we just scramble the words, and then the architecture is trained to recover the correct order. In a way, we are kind of learning a language model for those of you uh, who work in machine translation. Then, that's not enough. Then we also need to back, back translate. What is this? Um, one thing you can do is that you can use whatever the system learned, uh, you can use that small piece of information to produce a first crude English translation. So we put the a French sentence, and we produce a crude first English translation. Uh, this is just a forward pass, no learning. But now we can get this first crude translation, and we know which is the correct sentence that we need to recover. So we put it in the, in the input of the shared encoder, and now we know that it needs to produce the original French sentence, okay? So it's the same sentence all the time. So a French sentence in the input, we translate, we put it back in the encoder, and now we can uh, back propagate and learn end to end the encoder and decoder. Okay, we do this uh, mixing mini batches. Uh, so, in the same iteration, we mix mini batches. I think, yes, I need to start uh, wrapping up. And, well, um, I won't bore into the details. Uh, for those working in machine translation, many people say that below a score of 10, the system is not doing something sensible but we managed to go over the score of 10 and we started to produce some sensical uh, uh, results. So we managed to go to 15 in French English and English French and, uh, and the state of the art, sorry, and means it works, it's producing nice sentences. Uh, we also tried uh, semi-supervised, just to give you an idea, 
Google is doing much better. It's uh, around uh, 38 for English to French. But kind of uh, comparable architectures are getting also uh, not the same results as Google. So it's kind of a decent result for the architecture that we have. Uh, there's also this team in Facebook, which published uh, in Arc uploaded in Archive one day later, and we presented in the same conference. It's slightly less, but it's not meaningful. It's the same thing, because uh, at this point of the experimentation stages, we are not able to compare with one point. We cannot say that ours is better. It's just a similar system getting similar results. I can show you some cherry pick results, but I'll just move, because, again, why, why does this work? OK, what is the intuition? It's very early to say, but our intuition is that as we have the word embeddings mapped in the same space, we can use this mapped embedding space to produce what one could call the k-best translation for each source word. And the encoder decoder is just learning how to combine them. It's learning how to combine these k-best things into something which looks like the target language. Again, no need to magic. So the conclusions for this site, and uh, I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, so this has been very recent. So, the, so it was uploaded in archive, I think, in, in October, the same time. And uh, a new research area has started. So the main machine translation workshop uh, or conference, uh, they also have an, a supervised track right now. There are new papers coming out, uh, reporting bless of 25, which start to look like supervised systems. And uh, here you have the code. Our system is fully replicable. And uh, time for the final words. So word embeddings are key for natural language processing. Uh, people is doing wonderful things with them. Uh, when we are able to represent them in a common space, you can also do uh, exciting things. But for most language pairs, there are very few resources. So in this new research area, we just use monolingual resources. And I think that the results I showed you show that we, we are getting uh, breakthroughs in inducing a bilingual dictionary without any seed or anything, just out of the blue, and also inducing an unsupervised machine translation system which starts to, uh, to give uh, sensible results. As I said, the good news is that if you don't trust me, you could trust the Facebook people or vice versa. <laughs> so we have largely comparable numbers. Um, also, I want to stress that this is an area in its infancy. So I think there is still a lot of potential for research in this area. For instance, improving machine translation from low resource settings. That's, I think that's an exciting area where one could apply these techniques. And I think there's, uh, there's the potential for transforming the NLP landscape. So getting away from this labor intensive task of producing a tool set for each language separately, but for producing a unit. Uh, and a, a unique uh, set of tools more easier. So if anybody's interested, just talk to me after the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have touched it now for 45 minutes being embarrassed that I mentioned Facebook and not your papers. Um, <laughs> honestly, I read the other ones, so sorry. Um, let me start with one question. Do you have any estimate when it will be comparable to supervised learning? You mean machine translation? Yes. It's I difficult mean, it's, to say. You have something like, uh, you said, 25 to 38 years ago. So, so the last paper is 25, and our last ample research is also 25. Uh, we don't really know if there is an upper bound for this. Because in a way, if you do the mental exercise of uh, so for short sentences, it's easy. You get uh, five words in, in English, and you try to recover which is the, the correct sentence. So these systems are actually doing that, because the cross-lingual word embedding mappings, they are producing possible translations. And what the machine translation system, which we built on top of that, is trying to do is to put them together in, the, in such a way that they fit as nicely as possible. So I'm not sure there's an, an upper bound. It could be, of course, it's very difficult that they produce exactly the same uh, results as supervised in the in in-domain data. But I can imagine that maybe for out-of-domain data or in cases where there is no training data in this, that out-of-domain or for scarce uh, language pairs, so language pairs with scarce resources, it could uh, 
uh, work as well as uh, supervised. Okay, um, another question. You mentioned in between that the US didn't have as much resources as Google had for, for their machine translation. Right. Would that be also a reason? Or? Uh, that could be a reason. The, the Facebook team have, have uploaded a, a paper to archive one month ago or two months ago when they used uh, more, more uh, computing power and the new Google uh, architecture, Transformer. And just, just changing the architecture of the machine translation system, which is the, the backbone of this, uh, this thing, they improved 10 points. So it could be. So it's difficult to say because we don't have the computing power that they have, but it seems that it, makes, it can make a difference. Okay, to the first question, we didn't do a lot of fine tuning of hyperparameters. Um, so we, we tried something reasonable, so swapping at random. And do London uh, local swaps, I think uh, windows of two or three uh, is in the paper. But we didn't have time to tweak with the parameters. And I don't think it's sensitive, so sensitive to, the, to those parameters. I think that you need some, some kind of noise or reordering for the system to bootstrap learning, and then the back translation is making most of the, of the work for you. Uh, for the second question, uh, this leave my mind. It's, can you repeat it, please? Uh, what happens if you start uh, without it? So if you start with OK. We, we, didn't, we didn't try, but I don't think it would work. Because wh where do you start? You have nothing. Yeah, so. The, so that's the core of the, the core idea is that you are reusing the cross-lingual mappings to bootstrap your your system. Um, so what about the words that have many definitions? Uh, I suppose some languages are worse than others, where uh, one word has three definitions that each happen at thirty percent probability. Mm -hmm. this would if that was true for all words, it would break the system entirely. Um, so I guess, A, did you consider this? And B, um, is there an unsupervised way of filtering them out? OK, so my field is lexical semantics, originally. So that's the first question I made uh, to myself. So we looked into it. Well, in languages, you don't have something like uh, uniform probabilities <coughs> for senses. Most of the words which are polysemous have you know, spike probabilities. So you have the most frequent sense being 80, 90 most of the time. So in practice, we didn't see any problem with that. So I was hoping, when we don't were doing this, that um, part of the error in inducing dictionaries would come from polysemous words. But surprisingly, it's the most frequent words which is doing better. And as you know, most frequent words correlate also with polysemy. So I wanted to convince my students to look into it, but uh, they were not very excited when they checked the data. So. Also, for machine translation, it might not be so important because even if it's polysemous, you are able to recover most of the translations because they are in the neighborhood. You are not, when you induce a dictionary, we are returning the first, the closest translation, but there's no reason. You, can, you could return the three best translations. So if it's three-way polysemous, three words should suffice. So for machine translation, it's not so important. Uh, I wonder what happens with the cross-lingual mapping, why it's working so well for polysemous words. But I think that's a good question. I think we can take one last question. Uh, so if we can get in some of the standards, if you have uh, embedding space in two different languages with the topology is similar, I mean, uh, close things here or close there, but uh, what I hardly can imagine is this linear transformation 
question you get from one to the other more or less. Can you explain this in the narrative? It's going to be a long. It's going to be a long answer. <laughs> so it all comes from. So you know that the embedding space is correlated to the matrix factorization of co-occurrence space. So say in your language, uh, German maybe. So the co-occurrence of the word for dog, so the words which co-occur with dog, will be the same words that co-occur with, uh, with chakur in Basque, right? So if you see often dog with a bark, of dog with a uh, cat or whatever. In my language, you are going to see chakur, also very often with the word for cat and with the word for bark. So those concurrences, the, the statistics for those concurrences are the same across most of the language, which you know have some uh, overlap in their culture, okay, a large overlap. So that's where it comes from. So even if I was talking about the word embedding space as if they come from the blue, actually there are some uh, indications that these embedding spaces are actually a factorization of the concurrence space. And if that is the case, that's where all the signal comes from. Because when we all talk about the same things uh, here in, in Winterthur and in San Sebastian, so the, the co-occurrence statistics are the same for all these languages. Modulo, the local things that we, we don't share so much, but for the rest, it's... Uh, still, it's an open question. I mean, this is all intuitions. Uh, we don't have any proof. Yeah. I think we are already over time, and I know people want to go home, take, take the train, take the flight, whatever. Um, Nicholas, thanks again. Thank you. For this great talk. Thank you. Okay.